Dr. Sean, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the group? Yep. Okay. I can do that. So uh, my name is Dr. Sean Allison. Everyone mostly calls me Dr. Sean. Um, so I'm a veterinarian with Cleveland Equine Clinic. I've been there for just shy of 10 years. October will be 10 years. Um, before that, I actually worked with Dr. Genevieve, who I'm sure most people have heard of um, as a technician. And I started that, I was 18, I'm 36 now. So in the same way, shape or form, I've been involved in this for 18 years now. Um, my background is my father was actually an equine vet that also used to work with Dr. Genevieve. Um, and then my mother's side of the family does a uh, hunter jumpers. So I kind of have horses coming from all angles. And my wife is a three-day eventer. So you, I can't get away from it. So <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, so this PowerPoint is, is kind of a conglomeration that's based off of some of the sheets that I was sent um, about what you guys will be tested on for confirmation. If I miss something, I left something out and you have questions about it, please let me know. Um, I tried to get as many real life pictures as I could um, from either myself or the other vets in the practice. You can kind of see what real world is. Some of this stuff I couldn't get good pictures of, I apologize. So you're probably gonna see some schematics and diagrams that are probably similar to what you guys have in your glossary and your, in your lecture books. But um, I tried to do as much as I could. And I'm also doing the lameness part and that I have basically everything that's real and not off the internet. So I, I apologize for the stuff I couldn't get. I did as much as I could though. It was actually way harder than I thought it was, truthfully. I, I, I underestimated this confirmational aspect of the PowerPoint. So anyway, so we're gonna get started. Um, so number one, what is confirmation and why is it important? So simply, it's just the way the horse is built. Um, and this is crucial because how a horse is built and set up, if you will, uh, is keys to how it moves. Um, how it performs, it can potentially affect soundness. Um, and as many of you probably know, poor confirmation, uh, it can apply undue stresses and pressures, which again lead to soundness issues. Um, and even in our pre-purchase exams that we do, um, we make comments about confirmational things as much as we can touch on, because again, and I'll try to touch on some of these as I go, there are some confirmational things that you see in a horse that are less significant than others. And there's some things I really harp on in pre-purchase exams. And I'll try to kind of let you know those things that I personally pick on. May not be somebody else's, but they're things that I pick on. Um, just doing a couple of quick things on the shoulder and hip, because I know that was kind of in there. I didn't touch on it a lot, but so up top, you have a skeleton of a horse on the bottom, just a normal horse. So the one thing they did briefly talk about in your paper was the angle of the shoulder. Um, and basically what this is, if you look at the arrows, hopefully you can see the, the picture as well, but it's kind of the angle of the actual shoulder joint. So if you draw a line down the shoulder or the, the, the spine of the shoulder, if you will, and then you go down the humerus, it should be like 90 degrees. Um, if it's greater than a 90 degree angle, what a lot of times happens is that makes the horse's shoulder more upright and that can affect the horse's gait, and it can also, again, cause stresses and undue pressures on things. If it's less than 90 degrees, the legs actually start to go back behind the horse. Um, this can make them heavy on the forehand, and again, if it's any confirmation, that's not ideal. And keep in mind that very few horses are truly ideal confirmation. It's just, it doesn't happen. Um, that, again, can cause undue pressure. So hopefully, with the skeleton being there with a regular horse um, or a horse that actually is alive and has all of its tissue, you kind of get an idea where some of the bones are sitting, the angle of the shoulder um, and how that all works. So, but it just goes to show you the angle or the change in one area can also affect areas downstream from it. So it's important um, when you guys are looking at things in real life, you know, do whole horse. It's super easy. And I, and this is the same for vets when we start out, it's really easy to get tunnel vision and you start to miss stuff. You know, you're worried about is the horse towed in or out? In the meantime, like one hip six inches lower than the other. Like those aren't good things to miss. So always try to keep like a, a broad range of things. You, when I do pre-purchase exams, we do the confirmation part. I look at the whole horse. Like literally I go in the indoor ring and I walk all the way around the horse. And then I start to key in on the legs and my work my way down. Um, and that's good practice for you guys too. The whole horse and then all the way down. It doesn't have to be exactly like that make your own method of doing it, but then stick to it. Because the more you stick to it and you keep that routine, that regiment going, 
it's less likely that you're going to miss things or uh, or things kind of slip by you or you don't maybe put enough um, importance on them. And if I'm talking too fast, tell me too. Sometimes I start to go really quickly. My technician yells at me all the time. All right. So um, angle of the hip is one other thing they briefly touched upon. So basically, this is the angle of the croup, and this affects the horse's uh, ability to flex its lumbosacral joint. The lumbosacral joint is at the back, kind of where that the hind arrow by the croup comes up. Um, that's a big area for horses where they flex and bend and torque, particularly jumpers and hunters and things that go over fences, three-day eventers, steeple chasers. They get a lot of movement there from it. You know, they're not doing a lot of movement from like thoracic regions and other parts of their back. Um, you know, ideally you want to have a nice, long, slightly rounded. You don't want to have a real flat croup. Um, you know, that can cause, potentially cause issues with gait or even just how they move. Um, and then with and the flip side of that is the steeper croup can also cause issues. Um, but then again, you also remember that conformational things that aren't normal may not necessarily be bad. So again, like I listed, they're like steeper croups, they're shorter, but they're more powerful. So if you look at this horse where that line goes, that's kind of the line you want to follow. Um, there's also a good line of the shoulder too, which we'll come back to that. Um, so again, you have to look at the whole horse though, and you have to start from way back and come down. All right, so pasterns. Um, this side kind of plays off the last one with regards to the A to B line you see in the D to E line. So they usually say that the pastern angle should match the shoulder um, slope. It doesn't always happen, obviously. Again, perfect horses rarely occur. Um, but the, the general rule is front pasterns should be 45 to 50 degrees. Hind pasterns are 50 to 55 degrees. Um, and that's pretty consistent. A lot of time the hind pasterns are always steeper. It's pretty uh, normal to see that. Not always, but typically they should be a little bit more steeper than the, uh, than the front ones. All right, and instead of kind of making long-winded doubling up slides on pasterns of the front and the hind, kind of think of any of these conversations about the pastern, they apply to the front and the back. <coughs> Excuse me, I know we talked that the back should be steeper, um, but the same thing applies for upright versus short, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, hopefully that isn't an issue for you guys, but I just figured I'd keep things more condensed in that manner. So upright pasterns, um, if they're upright, so higher than that 45 to 50 we talked about, um, they don't make great shock, shock absorbers. Think of it's more like a pogo stick going straight into the ground. Um, because of that, they get a little bit more of a rougher gait. Uh, gait. It kind of puts more concussion through the foot and the rest of the leg. So think about, as you see down in the picture, like a quarter horse. Those guys like to be upright, um, particularly Western pleasure ones. They like to be real upright in their pasterns. And if you watch them go, they don't move like a fancy warm blood dressage horse. And they're not supposed to. That's not what they're supposed to do. But that just gives it kind of, you know, highlights the point of the different con conformations, how they affect how the horse moves. So if you're real upright, um, definitely you're more of a, a short strided movement. And that again, it can kind of play havoc on the feet and legs potentially. Um, diseases this could apply to, and this is kind of just touching on what we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks, is um, things that could affect is ring bone, side bone, navicular disease, among other issues. Um, the other thing to remember, too, which I forgot to say earlier, is horses don't have to have one conformational problem. You know, they don't have to just be upright. They can be upright in short pasturing. They can be upright in sickle hawk. So um, always watch. There's not always one thing that has to be wrong. There can always be more than one. Um, short pastern. Um, can you guys see my mouse on my screen or no? Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Okay. And just in case I need to move it there, I got to move this a little bit out of the way. You're in the way for that now. So short pasterns, um, they can be seen with or without being upright, but it is not uncommon to see short pasterns that are upright. Um, these are strong because they're shorter. So you get less kind of flex throughout the, the pastern, which then goes to the fetlock. Um, but again, usually these horses kind of have that, that gait that's a little bit, oops, sorry. Usually it has that gait that's a little bit shorter, um, but it's not uncommon to see both of those together. Um, 
steep pasterns. Um, this is just an example of one horse. They say these can be weak and more easily injured. Um, and the reason for that is the amount of movement that the pastern and the fetlock is allowed can put more stress like on the back of the tendons. Um, so horses with this type of, of conformation, you might see uh, bowed tendons, you might see suspensory ligament issues, fetlock, uh, osteoarthritis, and, and, and other various diseases. With that being said, if you look at fancy dressage horses and things like that, they usually have that more slope steep pastern, and that's what kind of gives them their bounce, if you will, even jumpers. Um, if you look at racehorses, I should have put that slide and I'll figure out a slide and show it to you guys in the lameness. If you look at racehorses when they run, and they're a very unique sport because when they're at full tilt, they only have one foot on the leg at, a, at one point in time. And so if you ever look up pictures of it, you'll look and literally the, the pastern and the fetlock are parallel with the ground. So it's almost flattened out. The reason they can do that is because of the bounce that they get from their pastern and their fetlock, which again, gives them that spring, which again, hunters, jumpers, dressage horses, three-day eventers, they have that spring. But you can obviously be too steep and because of that confirmation, you can potentially get injured. And that's another thing to mention. Just because you have conformational abnormalities does not mean the horse is going to get hurt. You can't say that horse is upright. You're going to have navicular disease in three years. I guarantee you, you can't do it. Might happen, but you can't, you can't say that. Um, but for sure, the, the steep slope pasterns, definitely harder on the soft tissues in the back of the leg. And that that also goes into the pastern too. There's tendons and ligaments in the pastern itself that can also be injured from this. And we'll touch upon that in the lameness record, uh, part two. So back at the knee, I'm sure everyone's always seen these. Um, for the back at the knee, basically they have a slight cant backward. Where's my hand going? Slight cant backwards. Um, because of this, you're gonna start to stretch the back of the leg and you're gonna crunch on the front of the leg. So I always try to keep things super simple when I think about them. So if they're can't back, like, or if they're uh, back to the knee like that, you're gonna stretch all the stuff on the back of it. You're gonna crunch all the stuff on the front of it. So these guys are more likely to get tendon and ligament issues, um, but then you also might see their knees start to get hurt, especially again at race horses that move real quickly, real fast, real hard. They could chip bones, um, they can crack bones. Um, so definitely not an ideal confirmation. This is probably one I pick on a little bit um, when they start to get back at the knee, um, especially when they're older, because as the horses get older, what you have is what you get. When they're younger, sometimes you can tweak things, especially when they're very young. You're worried about them having contraction issues or they're too lax. You can kind of address those. Um, but definitely it's one that I pick on and I, I do point out to some degree. It's not my number one pet peeve one, but it's, it's on the list. Um, to go with the knee, the, the old over at the knee, I'm sure everyone's seen the old quarter horse that's over at the knee, probably buckles at times. Um, and there's a couple of reasons they do that. Um, a lot of times with this confirmation, they can start to get osteoarthritis of the knee. When they get that osteoarthritis of the knee, it starts to kind of snowball. So they get worse and worse. So a lot of times these guys that are over at the knee, if you look at their knees, they look a little lumpy and brumpy on the front of it. And that's probably arthritic changes. Um, <clears throat> you'll also notice from the pictures that usually when they're bent at the knee, from the knee down is actually set a little bit backwards. Um, that's not uncommon to see either. Um, and if it's severe enough, it can cause stumbling issues. Um, and for me, that's always a concern because horses that stumble are always a concern for hurting the rider, people around them, and then obviously the horse themselves. So I don't like stumbling horses, whether it's a neurologic issue or osteoarthritic issue or conformational issue. Um, you'll also see this over at the knee a lot of times with horses that are also very upright in their pasterns. And that a lot of times is due to kind of a tendon contracture issue. And so everything from the bottom of the leg up kind of gets stuck over. And those things will be much more predisposed to that buckling over situation. Now, again, the quicker you get to it when they're younger, you can help it. Once they get older and the bones are set and nothing's growing, you kind of have what you have, unfortunately. Um, Bodney. Um, just like it sounds. So basically, if you go from the knees, they go out. So they kind of want to go away from each other in the middle. Um, if you try to draw a line down the the uh, the radius, 
down through the cannon bone, they want to be pushed a little bit out. Because of that conformation, it starts to put uh, stress on the knees and the outside of the limb just because of how they have to stress and carry themselves. And like I said before, you can see more than one conformational fault in a horse. And then if you look at this horse, the other thing you could comment on, he's also towed in. So again, don't just get fixed on one thing, say, oh, the horse has got bowed knees. Um, you always have to look at the whole leg because again, this horse is also towed in. Uh, knock knee. Now, as you can probably guess, this is a young horse. This is a bit of an exaggerated uh, example of it, but basically that's when the knees actually go inward towards the, uh, each other. So again, if you draw that line down the radius and their cannon bone, they're going to go in towards each other. Um, kind of the opposite of the bowed knees, this puts a lot of stress on the inside of the legs. Um, it can lead to splints. Um, it can lead to osteoarthritis of the, of the carpus and other joints for that matter. Now, this being a young horse, there are procedures that you can do to help it. Um, they can do surgeries where they actually strip part of the bone away and it causes it to grow faster. So hopefully they kind of start to straighten themselves out. You can even, uh, they even kind of use wire and screws and they kind of lock off the growth plate so one side can't grow and the other can. And so hopefully they right themselves. So again, young horse like this, I'd be, I'd have a higher expectation of maybe trying to be able to fix it. This was like a six-year-old horse that looked like this. This is what you got. So um, acknowledging conformational problems at a young age is very important for owners, veterinarians, trainers, everybody. Uh, bench knees um, or what people call offset knees. This is where, again, if you draw that plumb line, that cannon bone is kind of to the outside of the knee. So it's not lined up directly in the center of it. It's kind of pushed out to the sides. Um, this will put extra stress on the inside of the leg. Uh, and when you do that, again, you can get splints, you can get carpal problems. Um, those are probably the two bigger areas, but you can still, this can go kind of down the line and cause more problems. This was a good picture because it actually had the lines on it to kind of give you an idea. <clears throat> So some lower limb stuff. Um, this is actually a client of mine um, that is uh, towed out or how they say splayed out. Um, this horse is now, I think, a two-year-old. I saw it when it was a yearling. Um, and it actually was, uh, it could barely stand up. When it stood up, it actually knuckled over because it was so upright because it had grown too fast. So we did some things uh, to help change that, we basically starve the horse for all intents and purposes. You cut down their caloric intake as much as possible to stop this horse from growing too fast. Because what happens is bones grow faster than tendons and ligaments, and that's how you get contractual problems. They can't keep with, up with each other. So you can slow the bones down, you get more of an equal growth and, and the horse gets better. Now this horse was severe with its toed out from the get-go. Um, because it's young, as it grows, and this is, goes for most horses, as they grow, if they're toed out, their chest should widen and hopefully they kind of go a little bit straighter, but that doesn't make a real towed out horse gonna be normal, but you can hope as they get broader chested, it should help with that. Um, <clears throat> horses that are towed out, um, they usually like to kind of wing their legs, um, <coughs> excuse me, inward. Um, the problem with that is they can interfere with each other and they can cause lameness potentially. So they could whack themselves in the past or in the ankle, the cannon bone, even the knee, and that can eventually cause the injury and then that could cause lameness. And we'll talk about that uh, later on. Um, another thing to note with these guys is when you have this toed out appearance to them, uh, the inside of the hoof wall will kind of be unevenly loaded if you look at it because that weight's gonna go down to kind of more the central aspect of the horse's leg. And because of that, you're gonna up, you're gonna overload the inside typically more, so you can get problems with ring bone, uh, quarter cracks is a huge one, um, other injuries to the foot. Typically, guys that are towed out, um, they like to be more upright on the inside hoof wall, and that's what starts to cause the quarter cracks to occur. You actually look at horses' bones, particularly their cannon bones. The inside part of the cannon bone is always a little bit denser and thicker and bigger because they carry more weight kind of down the middle. So if you throw that off even more, you're loading things even more and then you start to see more problems. So again, that goes back to if you see a horse that's toe, <coughs> excuse, towed out, then start looking at the feet. Is one wall flared and the other one straight up? How the feet wearing? How's the coronary band run? Things like that. Uh, pigeon toed or toed in, I'm sure everyone's seen these before. Um, 
this is kind of the, obviously the opposite of the toed out, which means the horses will also move in a different manner that is opposite of toed out. So what these guys that are toed in like to do is they like to actually paddle out. So they'll paddle their legs outwards as they jog. Um, they don't have to just because you have these conformational issues. I see some horses that have very minimal toed in and they look like they're trying to wing their leg off. And I have seen other ones that are really toed in and they don't really do that much. So um, there isn't always that correlation between the severity of it and how they move. But if you start to watch horses and how their conformation goes, a lot of times they will follow the rules such as this one, which is if they're toed in, they paddle out. This is obviously causes less issues with interference because they're not whacking the inside leg or the opposite uh, inside leg potentially. So that's good. Um, but again, this puts on abnormal stresses and forces on the leg. So in this case, you'd start to worry about things on the outside of the foot. And just like we talked about ring bone, um, quarter cracks, now the quarter cracks on this one would probably occur on the outside. Um, and those feet will sometimes get more upright on the outside. And actually, if you look at this picture, the horse's right leg, so the left leg, if you're looking at it, see how the outside wall looks straighter up and actually the inside wall looks more flared. That's a pretty typical thing that you'll start to see with these guys. Um, and again, you can get arthritis in multiple joints, you know, not only the ring bone, which is in the pastern, but arthritis in the fetlock too. This is the one that I could not find a real life picture for you to save my life. I tried, there's eight veterinarians in our practice and I still couldn't get one. So it's called tighten at the knee. So basically what happens is if you go directly below the knee, um, the tendons are super small, almost abnormally small for the rest of the leg. Like they're being squeezed or tied. That's why they call it tight at the knee. It's like someone cinched right below their knee and it got real small. This is the only picture I could get that halfway made sense. Um, if I happen to find one that really makes sense, I will send it to you guys, but this is the best I could do. Um, but because they're smaller, that in this case, it usually means they're weaker. So you have more problems potentially with injury because it's not going to be um, equivalent to the rest of the horse's body, especially say you have a real big quarter horse um, that's going to cause issues. I promise that's like the worst picture I have. Um, so looking at general stance, you know, we talked about the knees, we talked about towing in and towing out. Um, but as far as how horses stand, and I, you have to be super, super new for careful with this because it is very easy to make horses stand in an illogical manner where they don't look correct at all. Um, probably the hardest part of my job is trying to make horses square up so I can actually judge their conformation because they never want to do it, especially thoroughbreds that are off the track. They don't want to stand square to save their lives. Um, but it's important to make sure they stand in a natural position. You know, sometimes if you try to pick up a leg and place it, you're going to put it not where they really carry it. And so that's not a true confirmation or, or overall look at how they stand. Um, so just a couple tips for you guys. I see some people go and place a foot down, but that might not be where that horse wants to stand, which means that's not really its confirmation. Um, so horses that stand under, uh, kind of how it sounds, that means that the legs are actually set back a little bit. Um, kind of put it behind the plumb line. So I drew in a line here. If you put a line down the shoulder, they want to carry that, that leg kind of behind. Um, because of this, um, it kind of puts the balance forward on the horses. So in theory, this would probably be a harder horse to kind of keep collected and things like that if you were riding. Um, if you think about what we talked about earlier with the angle, which I didn't draw this in, but if you look at that horse's uh, shoulder, it may be a little bit more open than 90 degrees to, or it may be different than 90 degrees, which may give you why that is. So again, always try to try to tie everything together. Don't look at it as separate pieces because a lot of times things can be tied together. Uh, camped out. Um, so just the opposite. So if you drew a plumb line down the shoulder, it wants to put its legs farther forward. Um, and you also have to be aware of the horse if there's some issue going on. Say a horse had laminitis or founder in both front feet, a lot of times they stand camped out. So that might not necessarily, necessarily be the horse's normal stance. It may be compensation for an issue. So always keep that in mind too. Um, but basically, again, you draw that line down, the horse's shoulder is going to be more leg in the front. And as you can imagine, the farther they put their legs in front, it's going to start to pull on everything on the back of their legs. And it, in theory, puts more pressure on the back of their feet and their heels, too. So you'd have to watch for stuff. Uh, my mouse doesn't like to move. Back in here. 
Um, that's a little bit more of an exaggerated example. Um, but at least it kind of gets the point across. Uh, base wide. Um, this is probably a young horse judging from its bone structure. Um, but what you have is the legs are wider apart at the feet than at the chest. Um, this horse does not have a narrow chest, but a lot of times you do see that with narrow chested horses. They almost kind of want it to splay out at the bottom to some degree. Not necessarily like the knee knock, but they just kind of want to, they want to kind of splay out. Um, because of this, it puts more pressures on the, on the lower limb. So you can get problems in the foot. You can get ring bone. Uh, if, if you guys aren't familiar with ring bone, when I use that term, that's arthritis at the pastern. It's either in the first pastern joint or the second pastern joint, but they're both called ring bone. If it's in the upper one, we say it's high. If it's in the lower one, we call it low ring bone. I should have said that earlier. If I say something you guys don't understand, like it's a term you haven't heard, please try and stop me. Uh, I apologize for that. Also, if you look at this horse, if you want to make comments on it, he looks like he's going to be slightly towed in on the right front and he has those offset knees too. So again, always look at the whole horse because you can, most of these pictures that I put up here, if you look at them, you can probably pick on multiple conformational things and try and do that while we're looking at these. You know, I might be talking about base wide or something, but look at it and be like, oh, you know what? That horse looks like its knees aren't right or hey, his foot's towed in or something like that. All right, where you go little mouse. <clears throat> So base narrow, just the opposite. And I drew these lines in to kind of help uh, reiterate it. But basically, the feet are closer than the shoulders are up high. Um, this starts to put a lot more concussion in the down through the legs. If you remember, I said earlier, they usually carry more weight towards the middle of their body anyways. So then when you kind of scrunch everything together, you're just, you know, increasing the amount of pressure and concussion and pounding that they take. Um, that particularly kind of goes more to the outside of the legs, which also isn't used to taking that much. Um, so you can start to get problems on the outside of the leg. Um, if horses are like this, they don't have to be, but if they're like this, a lot of times they'll do what's called plating, um, P-L-A-I-T-I-N-G. This is basically where they cross over. So instead of their front and their hind legs moving in two gates like this that are separate, they almost start to cross over in front. Again, they don't have to be like this to do that, but it's not uncommon or you start to see them do this. That in itself isn't necessarily a big deal, but because of that, they may whack each other, may, they may whack their legs when they do that. Um, and they could potentially stumble if they catch themselves, especially if horses have conformational problems. The harder they go, if they start to get tired, um, they may be more likely to interfere. Think about if you guys are playing sports. Like when you're in the first part of the game, like you're energized, you're running around, you got total control of your body. The farther into the game, you start to get tired. Maybe like you don't kick a ball right, or maybe you kind of stumble a little bit. You don't catch yourself. Your muscles get tired and you can't move quite the way you want. So if you have a conformational issue on top of that, it makes it more likely to do stumbling, tripling, and things like that. So, All right, so that's most of the front end. So let's go to the back end. So cow hocked. Um, cow hocked and sickle hocked are probably the two most common terms that I see people confuse when they talk to me about stuff. Um, so cow hocked is basically when the hocks start to point in towards each other, that makes the can of bones kind of slant or point outwards. Um, I've had people call this sickle hocked. They don't necessarily have to be sickle hocked. You can have sickle hocked and cow hocked horses at the same time, but they're two separate conformational things. Um, the reason this is important is it puts, again, extra stress on certain parts of the body, um, in particular, the inside of the hocks. Um, and typically that's where you find most arthritis start in the hocks is towards the inside of the leg. Um, because of that, the inside gets the arthritis more quickly than the rest of it. That is typically also why horses will start to uh, plate behind or, or I'll call it crossing over or tight roping because they want to bring their legs farther inside so they get the weight off the inside of their legs because that's what hurts more, just kind of as a off thought. Um, uh, you know, other hock issues are in that area that this can lead to is, which I talked about, hock arthritis, but bog, spavin, and thoroughpen. And those are terms we'll touch base on in the, uh, the lameness uh, PowerPoint that we have in a couple of weeks.
but kind of keep this stuff in mind, uh, these confirmations and how they, they kind of pull into what lameness issues they can have. Here's your sickle hawk. So it looks like a sickle if you've ever seen a sickle. Um, basically the hawks are slightly bent uh, with the lower leg starting to angle towards the front of the horse. So my rule is if you take a line, you draw it down the back of the horse's butt, it should hit the back of the butt, the back of the hawk, the back of the ankle. Um, if it's farther forward, like in this case, this is a sickle hawk horse. Um, conformationally, obviously this isn't normal. This one doesn't really bug me that much um, with regards to like doing a pre-purchase exam or doing a confirmational exam for someone. Someone just wants to know about the horse and how it looks and what they should be worried about. Um, this one I have, I don't harp on real hard. Um, you know, obviously it can cause problems. You know, it can lead to hawk arthritis, curbs, thoroughpin, things like that. But again, also just because a horse has conformational ch changes or abnormalities does not mean they have to have lameness. Um, but obviously it makes it more, a higher likelihood that they could get orthopedic problems and then that could potentially cause lameness. But I see this quite often. This one doesn't worry me that much. I think after this one, I'm gonna have a straight up hawk, which is the bigger thing. So again, so the sickle hawk, it kind of wants to go forward at the bottom. The opposite of that for me is what they call straight or post-legged hawks or horses that are upright. This is my number one super nagging conformational abnormality. <clears throat> Even though my wife bought a really nice horse that has it <laughs> and it's my least favorite conformation. Um, basically what happens is they are too straight through the hock, but also this makes them too straight through the uh, stifle too. Um, and, uh, the, the, uh, the top picture is a pretty uh, significant one. Um, I mean, it almost looks like the leg is straight up and down. The bottom one, the horse is not standing square, but you can get an idea that the horse wants to be upright. Um, you know, because of this, they can kind of almost just swing their legs forward more without bending them as much. Um, but that puts more pressure on everything. So these horses, they more likely for stifle issues, um, hock issues, including arthritis, theropin. Um, when you go lower down the leg, this puts a ton of pressure on their suspensory ligaments and their tendons. Um, you'll start to see these guys get ankle sink. And again, if you look at that top picture, see how the, the pastern angle becomes real steep and the ankle looks like it's sinking towards the ground. To me, if I was doing a pre-purchase exam for one of you guys and you showed me this horse, this would be a, a, a big, how we, we call them reservations or abnormalities that are important. If your horse has a scratch on the side of its shoulder that only the hair is missing, that's not a reservation. This would be a reservation for me because long-term, this has a likelihood of causing lameness issues. Um, there's been a lot of papers done about hock angle and how they um, correlate to suspensory problems. A doctor by the name of Sue Dyson out of Europe, who is a very, very well-known doctor that does a bazillion papers a year there, she's done several papers and there's a certain angle that if you start to go over, it increases the load on the suspensory ligaments and that can cause bigger problems. So this is probably my number one pet peeve, for sure. Uh, bowed hock, just kind of like the bowed knee. So at the hock joints themselves, they kind of want to go away from each other. Uh, this starts to put some pressure, extra pressure on the outside of the leg. So it could again, lead to things like uh, arthritis or bone spab and, um, thorough pens, I didn't list all those things, but basically the same issues uh, kind of come, even if you have different conformational problems, they'll still cause the same general issues. Again, it's a loading problem. They're not, they're not loaded correctly. There's abnormal stresses and that causes abnormal problems. Horse has a super nice tail though. I don't know what that is, but that's very impressive. Looks like it's from like Game of Thrones or something. Uh, so hind limb, this is a super exaggerated <laughs> example of this, but um, this is what we call camped out behind. So basically that horse is, if you were to draw that line we talked about down the butt to the hock to the ankle, everything's farther back, particularly the hock. Um, and what this does, is it makes it harder for these horses to come forward and really engage themselves. Um, Morgans love to stand the horses up like this. Um, they like to have them standing kind of camped out behind. Um, 
because they can't really engage the hind end as well if they have this conformational abnormality they don't get as much speed and power so these aren't horses you'd be seeing like really ripping around the field necessarily this don't get that overall power compared to other breeds but morgans like to do this some saddlebreds and stuff you know if you think about it you don't see quarter horses standing like this and think about like your barrel horse your rainer horses and your cutters i mean they have so much power from behind and they're the total opposite of this Um, too narrow behind, um, kind of to go off of the bowed tars, bowed hocks. Um, basically those feet are coming closer together. Um, you could also theoretically say this horse is cow hocked, um, just because of how he's standing. But you, if you draw that plumb line down the back of their leg, it starts to come within it. Um, again, you start to get, um, extra pressures applied to the outside of the leg, um, and that can cause problems. Um, kind of like how we talked about the plating and the front end where they kind of want to cross over or kind of want to follow one line of tracking. Um, these guys will do this too with this confirmation. You don't have to have this confirmation to do that, but this confirmation can make you more likely to want to do that plating or what I call crossing over or, or tight roping behind where they kind of swing their legs. And again, that can then lead to things like interfering and then potentially stumbling. But the stumbling stuff, usually you see on the front end more when horses are doing it. They don't typically stumble with the back. Uh, wide behind, I couldn't find a super good wide behind horse. Um, but this is basically where, again, if you draw that plumb line, the legs are trying to go more to the outside of it than kind of straight down the middle. Um, because of this, these horses kind of want to have like a short strided gait, almost like a, like a bulldog kind of going. Um, this is something you'll see in quarter horses and those big muscled breeds horses, and they want to stay kind of wider behind. They don't want to track in a more normal uh, manner. Um, so that was most of the confirmation stuff with regards to how the horses are standing, how their legs are going. So we're going to touch more on kind of the motion aspects, and I'm going to try and kind of um, build off of the confirmation stuff and, and, and how they kind of play in. So interfering is just a general term. And again, this can kind of go for the front or the hind end where a horse will strike one leg um, with the opposite side. So it has to be a front to front or a back to back. Um, you know, if they do whack each other, if they have confirmation, like we talked about, like saying they're towed out or something like that, um, they can lead to getting splints because they actually traumatize the bone hard enough, the bone reacts and they start to get problems and you get those lumpy splints. The plus side is splints don't typically cause significant long-term lameness issues. They might be more of a cosmetic blemish, but uh, they don't usually become really big issues normally. Um, like I said, the toed, in, toed out horses, or again, the base narrow horses that we just talked about because they wanna do that plating thing they might hit behind. And that goes for the hawks that are uh, the, the too close behind. Um, like we talked about before, since they're already moving close behind for some reason, if, again, if they get tired, it's more likely for them to whack themselves, hit themselves because they just don't have that fine, they don't have that motor movement that they need. Um, so horses that do this, standard bred racehorses love being towed out and they love hitting their knees. Um, if you look at them, they have like these big bulges on the inside of their knees and they even get like big swellings that you can drain um, because they like to be towed out. And a lot of times they're even close and towed out. So it's really just asking for it. Um, so because of that, they make bandages and wraps that you can put on the knees or wear splint boots, um, things like that, that kind of help protect it because particularly if a horse has a shoe on, whacking it hurts. You can imagine that doesn't feel good. So wearing protective bandaging or, or other equipment helps. Um, for me, if I'm trying to get an idea of what might be bugging a horse, um, things you look for is do they have cuts on the inside of the leg, whether it's the front or the back. If I see a horse that's kind of got cuts and old scars and scrapes on the inside of the pastern and the, and the fetlock behind, I start wondering if it's hocks or an issue. And because it's hocks or hurting, it moves in a manner where it interferes with itself. So um, just things to look for. And the same applies for the front. You know, are there little cuts and abrasions and things like that that don't really have a reason um, for being there? <clears throat> Come on, little mouse. Uh, brushing, 
this is like less, in my opinion, this is like a less severe of interfering. Um, this was a horse I was doing a lameness exam on, um, and I kind of shot this picture where you can see it's not really whacking itself, but it's it's coming into close contact. Um, if you look how the right front foot is on the ground, it's towed out. So again, towed out horse wants to swing in, so it's trying to do that brushing manner. Um, so they don't have to hit themselves. That is not why that horse had that bandage on. I can't remember why it did, um, but it had nothing to do with that. Um, winging or winging in. Um, so this is basically, you can see this typically at the walk or the trot. Um, and it's what you usually see, uh, what we just talked about with the toad out. So the walk, you'll sometimes catch it. The trot, you usually will see it. Um, but when they want to wing in, um, again, think towed out horses or the, or the guys that are close together. Um, and kind of like we've talked about a couple of times, they can bang the inside of their legs. Again, standard breads. This was a baby standard bread. Again, I caught this while it was at the trot, but you can see, I know the one foot doesn't look towed out, but when this horse just stands normal, it's towed out. It's trying to wing that leg in towards the other leg. Um, and again, being small though, there's hopefully things that we can do to kind of help correct that, that confirmation that may be leading to this winging manner. Paddling, so the exact opposite of the winging in paddling. This goes to those horses that are towed in. They want to paddle it out. Now, again, this is a pretty exaggerated horse, but you can see how far it wants to throw it out. Um, some of them will be pretty severe. I've had technicians that are jogging horses that almost get hit in the back of the leg because the horses paddle that significantly. Um, so, but that's kind of an example of a, a horse under saddle paddling. Again, usually you're gonna see that at the trot. Sometimes at the walk, they'll start to get like a little flip out, but usually at the trot, you really start to notice the paddling or the winging in for that matter. So just remember, if they're towed in, they wanna paddle out. If they're towed out, they wanna bring it in. Uh, forging. Uh, so this is basically when a horse hits its front foot with the hind foot on the same side. So it has to be both left or both right. Um, typically this happens at the trot. Um, again, like we keep saying, if the horse is tired, they may not have be as careful with their legs. So they may hit. Um, if they're a little bit too much on the forehand, um, if their toes get long, uh, they're real short backed or long legged um, or both together. Um, it makes it easier for them to do that. But remember, it's where the, the hind foot hits the back foot. Uh, there's that kind of schematic drawing, but the other two, you can get a better idea of it. Uh, these horses too, particularly, you'll catch this obviously when they're trotting, but even walking sometimes, but like if you're lunging, you'll start to hear like that knock. That's a lot of times them hitting their foot. So when you watch horses go, don't just watch, but also listen because that also helps you. Listening, we kind of do all that. You should listen and you should watch. Um, overreaching, so not the same thing as forging. Those are technically two different, these are two different kind of abnormal abnormalities to gaits. So this is when the hind foot grabs uh, the heel, typically is what you'll see. So I'm sure you guys have seen those horses. It's why they allow horses wear bell boots or because they, they reach up and they try to pull their shoes off. Um, so this is basically when they grab the back of the front leg. They have what's called a high overreach. That's when basically they're grabbing like the pasture and the ankle or even the cannon bone. That's much less uh, likely, um, but it can happen. Usually they're doing heel grabs. They're grabbing the heels. Um, this is normally something you'll see when they're more at a faster speed, like a gallop, uh, particularly also if they're in deep, footing. Uh, again, doesn't have to be at the gallop, but it's more of a gait that you might see this. Uh, and it doesn't have to happen in deep footing, but it can. Um, but I'm sure everyone's seen horses that have taken a little chunk out of their the back of their heel or their coronary band or things like that. Um, a cool trick if a horse is doing this a lot and you can't figure out what it, where exactly it's hitting, um, you can take lipstick and you put it on the mark that they keep making. And then when you get done using the horse, you check the hind feet and see where the mark is. It sounds really silly, but it really works. So if you're trying to figure out where exactly they're hitting, you mark it and a lot of times they show you where it's happening. Um, the same conformational changes that cause forging can cause this again, short backed, long legged, if they get tired. Um, 
And again, that's why people wear bell boots or protective uh, shoeing or uh, protective bandages just to help prevent this because they can get pretty gnarly. They can be pretty bad reach, especially say in a thoroughbred racehorse. And uh, at some tracks, they allow them to have toe grabs. So at the bottom of their shoe at the toe, there's like a little outcropping that gives them better traction. Those really don't do well if they grab something because it kind of like digs in and pulls back. So those can get pretty gnarly. Um, here's kind of your miscellaneous stuff. Um, so pig eyes, um, not something I typically comment on. I don't think I definitely necessarily see this that often, but this is basically where their eyes are disproportionately small, smaller than their head um, without some other abnormality. Some horses can get eye problems and their eyes actually shrink, but this is not that. Um, that's called inophthalmus. Um, but basically the eyes are too small for the head and a lot of times they're sunk in. It is said that horses that kind of have pig eyes can have um, kind of a poor temperament, not great to be around, uh, hard to handle. Um, again, I don't see these that often, although ironically this week I had a pig eyed horse and it was super not nice to work on. So I don't know if that was just that one horse, but it was pig eyed and it was not nice to work on. So they're definitely not something I see all the time, but it's a, it's a conformational abnormality of the head. Cause remember the head can have things. When I do my pre-purchase exams, we talk about symmetry of everything, including the head. Are the eyes even? Is one smaller than the other? Is the nose pulled to one side? All those things are still conformational changes. Now we didn't talk about them in this talk, but those are things you have to look at is the head too, is an, is an ear droopy, um, things like that. <clears throat> I just thought it'd be funny to put a picture of a pig up there too, because I only had one picture of a pig eye. Uh, mutton withers. Um, so basically these are where the withers are very kind of flattened out and you don't have a real defined shoulder region. Um, as you can guess, this can cause problems with saddle fit. So you may have problems getting saddles to fit appropriately, and that can then cause soreness issues in the withers or even the shoulder, which can then make the horses not move correctly because of the saddle. So saddle fit's important. You have to base your saddle off your horse. Um, one of the things that you can see, and so the top arrows are actually kind of showing you where the withers are almost, they're flattened out. Um, but the other thing below, if you look, this horse has a very upright shoulder. It's way higher than the, probably that 90 degrees. So because of that, your shoulders are going up. Um, this horse isn't built downhill, but horses that are built downhill will sometimes have this problem too. So again, if you see one conformational abnormality, look to see if there's another one that ties in. Um, because of this conformation, particularly with the shoulders very upright, um, they don't have as much movement, so they have a much more stiff or shorter stride. It's not kind of a nice flat, uh, fluidy, um, outgoing one. It's a lot more reserved. You can maybe call it choppy potentially. Uh, U-neck. So um, some people call this an upside down neck which you have to sit there and think about. It. If you flip it upside down, it probably is more so what the neck should look like. A um, couple characteristics of that are the muscles at the bottom of the neck are real thick. So if you look at the bottom arrow, they're super exaggerated. They're very big. Um, on the flip side of that, the neck at the top is kind of concave. And if you think about most horses, especially if they start to get a little bit of extra fat in their neck, they're usually more of a concave or, or a convex or, or bowed shape. This one almost kind of sinks in like the inside of a spoon, not the outside of the spoon. Um, because their necks are kind of built so wonky for all intents and purposes, um, a couple of things you'll see these horses, they like to have a much higher head carriage than normal. Um, and because of how the neck's kind of proportioned, they don't always have a lot of great flexion to the neck. Uh, and the head carriage goes with the head position. So not a good neck position. And again, actually, if you look at this horse, its shoulders look pretty upright too. It's got a nice haircut though. Swayback, everyone's seen a swayback horse. Um, this is a pretty exaggerated swayback horse. Um, this is also what they call lordosis. Um, basically there's a, a curvature in the spine uh, of some degree or another. Um, there is no real correlation necessarily to swayback horses and athleticism and potential problems. Um, race trackers sometimes think that thoroughbreds that are swaybacked are super fast. Um, not always the case, but they can run and they can win and they can make money. Um, so 
just because a horse is sway backed doesn't mean there's going to be some sort of significant problem with it. Um, now, if you saw your dog like this or your cat, it'd probably be paralyzed. Horses are kind of unique creatures where this type of conformation doesn't necessarily affect them in a neurologic or uh, movement way. Um, when they're uh, when it's kind of an older horse and, and they can change throughout time, they can dip more. Um, it's usually a combination of soft tissue attachments, um, issues and other things that kind of let it start to bow. Um, the way you can measure which are the two red arrows there is you can put one at the withers and the point of the hip and you measure how far the tape measure goes straight and then you let it dip and then you measure the dip and that's kind of your change. So in theory, you can track how sway back a sway back horse gets over time. Um, when they're young, um, that's sometimes a congenital problem, um, and the vertebrae aren't necessarily shaped normal. So and think of it, instead of having like a block, I mean, that's kind of a rough idea, but instead of a, uh, one of the, the bones of the back being a, of the vertebrae being like a, like a square or a block or a rectangle, rather, they kind of want to get a little bit wedge shaped. And then if you think about it, if you put a bunch of triangles together, what do they do? They kind of make a, like a semicircle, right? Truthfully, there's not been a lot of research done into swaybacks. Like there's not been a lot of like genetic mapping and things like that. If you look at the flip side of it, if you look at problems, which not isn't confirmational, but as an example, kissing spines. So that can be a real problem with horses of, of any discipline of any breed. They just did a really big study that actually there is kind of a genetic marker or predisposition in thoroughbreds for having um, kissing spines. So if they have this genetic piece in them, um, they're more likely to develop kissing spines. So that's kind of a new thing that came out. So, but sway back because it doesn't usually cause problems other than it looks kind of funny. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research done into it. Kissing spines is a huge thing. So there's been a lot more money put into that. I guess it'd be harder to fall off this horse too front to back because you're kind of stuck in there. So that's good. <laughs> Come on, mouse squids. Uh, the goose rump or steep croup. Um, this is basically they have a really, really slow, uh, uh, significant slope to their hindquarters. Um, because they have less muscling and less development, that's going to make them have a less efficient and powerful uh, stride. Um, you can see this on horses that have tipped, uh, tipped pelvises or sickle hocked. Um, I know the picture on your right, the gray horse isn't standing square, but I'm willing to bet you if he was, he looks like he's sickle hocked. So again, you can see certain conformational abnormalities together. Um, doesn't mean you have to. Now, again, also if the horse is super old they, and retired, maybe they're just losing muscle because they're not doing anything. So you always have to take those things into consideration. But if you have like an active fit, you know, young middle-aged horse and they kind of have that, what they call the goose rump or the steep croup, you know, that may affect how they move and the power that they can get from behind. Um, slab sided. Um, so basically instead of having a rib cage, which you I put, a, there's a normal on the one side, there's an abnormal on the other, instead of having kind of that nice barrel shape, if you will, to the horse, um, the ribs kind of want to lay more flat. So they don't have that nice shape to them because of this. In theory, there's less room for all their organs in their chest. Um, and so um, their heart and lungs, they might not have as much room to do things. So in theory, it could affect uh, their endurance and, it, and the ability to exercise. You'll see horses that don't, and, and obviously different breeds have different looks. If you look at like big war bloods and stuff like that, sometimes they like to get a barrel. Uh, like a lot of standard bred racehorses and, and variations of that, they're a little bit more slender built. And those horses run for miles pulling someone in a cart or, or a bike, however you want to say it. Um, so that doesn't mean they, like the horse can't run a mile. That's not what that means. But again, there is the potential that may not have that much endurance. Kind of like the mutton withers, if they're really narrow, um, you may have saddle fit issues. So these are horses that may require someone to help you with your saddle fit and you just can't kind of run over to Big D's and grab a saddle and throw it on and then go to the rodeo. Um, but again, just because they don't have quite a, a more significant barrel doesn't necessarily mean they're not athletic and things like that. So that's kind of it. So, I mean, for me, the takeaways are, 
you know, number one, confirmationally, you have to look at a horse as a whole. Don't kind of get tunnel vision and only look at one thing like, oh, I got to make sure the feet are okay. Or if the knees are too close, look at the whole horse. Like I said, I, when I do my exams, I put the horse out where there's enough room and I walk all the way around the horse start. And then I kind of work my way down because you'll start to see some problems feed off of each other. Um, just because horses have conformational abnormalities does not mean they're going to get lame. It does not mean that they might, they're going to for sure develop orthopedic issues, but it means they have may have a higher likelihood to. Um, and again, they can have more than one issue. Again, for me, probably my biggest pet peeve is the post-legged horses because um, they start to get ankle sink and other problems like that. So, um, you know, again, obviously you want the perfect horse, but again, the perfect horse usually is not there. And if it is, you probably can't afford it <laughs> because it's perfect. Um, but um, that's kind of the short and narrow. Um, I hope uh, that kind of fed somewhat off of Dr. Gebhardt's talk. Um, and then kind of the next lecture in two weeks from now on lameness, a lot of this stuff will come up again, the confirmation and, and, and gait and, and motion and how they work. The pig eyes is not going to make another appearance. So if you really enjoyed that, I apologize. This is the first and last time you're going to hear about that. Um, but a lot of the other stuff will come into play and, and hopefully kind of parlay off of this talk. Because, you know, you heard me talk about bone spav and a bunch and bog spav and thoroughpin and curbs and splints and ring bone and side bone and navicular disease and tendons and ligaments. So all that's gonna come back up. So hopefully by the time we get these three lectures put together for you guys, it'll come full circle. So um, that's kind of it on my end, so. All right, does anyone have any questions? Burning questions. Or if you didn't understand something or I didn't touch on something or you want me to go back in the slides, please let me know now. Um, I have a question. What is osteoarthritis? All right, good question. So osteoarthritis is basically inflammation of, of a joint that starts to cause um, problems that you can see on x-ray. So when people start talking about, oh, my, the doctor said my horse has a spur in its hock, um, that's a form of osteoarthritis, uh, or he has a spur in his stifle. Um, when we talk about ring bone, that osteoarthritis of the pasternids, so those are become bony changes of, of a joint um, that can affect the horse adversely and cause lameness potentially, or movement issues for that matter. Um, but there'll be a lot of examples of different types of osteoarthritis in, um, <clears throat> in the lecture in two weeks, but that's a good question. Just like us, just like, you know, all oh, my dad's got arthritis in his knee or my mom's got a tennis elbow and has arthritis. Same thing, just different joints built differently. So they get, they get problems too, especially for as big as they are. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Did anyone, I know I put in the homework to like look at your horse and determine if they have any sort of major conformational issues. Does anyone know if their horse has like one thing that they could kind of pick out or? Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Um, my horse, he, especially his left front, um, he's towed out, so he has some ring bone on his left front. Yeah, and that's a good point kind of to play off what you just said is, like it doesn't have to be both. Like, so when you get stuff down to like the foot, we're talking about towing in, towing out. And there's a lot, you could have a whole talk on foot conformation. They don't have to have both. Like you can have a towed out leg on just one or a towed in on just one. In theory, you could have a towed in and a towed out, but I don't see that that often. Um, but yeah, so you also don't, you know, these things don't have to be paired either, especially stuff in the foot. Um, but yeah, so in your case, it's, it's, it's likely, or it's, there's the potential that that confirmation could have led to the ring bone. But again, just because you have a conformational abnormality, <clears throat> again, doesn't mean I have to say, oh, Emerson, in 10 years, your horse is going to have to have it. Like it, it doesn't. But again, you have to be aware of that. And that's why, you know, like with what you guys are doing with, with Pony Club is it's good to acknowledge those things because they can set up the potential for that. Or say, you know, you want to buy a horse as a breeding stud, you know, if they kind of got really wonky looking legs, that's probably not going to be the horse you would want to try and breed because it's possible that 
siblings are going to have wonkiness. And we'll touch more about that too in the next lecture about some diseases that occur that you don't want to just pass down because it's not really good for the horse. It's not good for you guys. Anyone else have conformational changes in their horse that they can think of off the top of their head? Um, my horse is slightly uphill. He has upright pastern, slightly cow hawk. Uh, and he also has low heels, which we've talked to the barrier about and was mentioned during our pre-purchase exam. Yeah, and yours is tough because sometimes when you get compounding conformational abnormalities, it gets tough because like a horse that's low in the heels, what do you want to do? You want to raise the heels. But then you have a horse that's already upright. So if you raise your heels too much, you start to push everything forward. So it, it makes it trickier for veterinarians, inferiors, and owners to try and combat conformational problems because sometimes by fixing one problem, you may affect another problem. And so you have to be very conscientious of that. Um, and again, so I would, you know, it sounds like you had a pre-purchase exam, but those are things to watch out for. And I list things and when we do pre-purchase, I list stuff. Like I list all the conformational problems and I try to assign some sort of risk. And again, to me, some things have a higher risk than others. Um, so, but yeah, and again, also an example of a horse doesn't have to have one conformational uh, issue either. So that's another a good, good, good thing to bring up. Anybody else's horses? Madison, Susie, Greg, you guys are very quiet. <laughs> Half your face is off the screen. It's like you're hiding. <laughs> uh, my old horse that my sister now has toes in a little bit and paddles when he trots. Yep. So there you go. So perfect example. Again, if you start watching, you will start to notice these things do correlate. You know, the toed in horse wants to paddle out, the toed out horse wants to come in. Um, definitely start to watch that stuff because you'll start to notice it more than it'll make. It'll make the more you watch it, the more it makes sense and watch them how they go. Another cool thing that you guys can do too, when you watch horses go, if you're at pony club or you just want to watch somebody's friend's horse go or your own horse go is if you take your phone um and do slow-mo do slow motion video it's cool to watch them go whether it's in a straight line at you or going across you or even lunging to watch like how their feet really do fly in there because sometimes they move so quick it's hard to watch right like you're like i don't know what the leg's doing like it's going forward i don't know which direction after that um if you do the slow-mo video or just do a regular video and then slowly go through it with your thumb, you can watch like how they want to wing out or wing in, or some of them, when they land, maybe they land on the outside of their foots, then roll in, or they land on the outside or inside, then roll out. So those are all things you can watch too. So don't be afraid to play with your phones and almost break down the motion of your horse. And then you can kind of then tie that into the confirmation and be like, wow, I guess I didn't realize my, especially if they're subtle. You may not really notice a winging out or a winging in or, or things like that. Again, some of the examples I gave are drastic, but that's to get the point across. But you can have varying levels of things like sickle hocked and upright confirmation and, and things like that. So don't think your horse is either perfect or ungodly straight up behind. Like that's not the case. You can have varying conditions. So uh, what about you, Madison? Anything to add to the talk? I'm not gonna so. I had my vet out because we had to do like, um, we did like spring injections and stuff. And yeah, your vaccine, my, yep. My horse is a, he's a new horse to our family. So yep. we had to do like a overlook of him and mm -hmm. we really didn't find anything of a confirmation that was like bad in a way. Yep. He's and very you together. <laughs> Yeah, and you don't always, and some of them are super minor. Again, like the the toad out don't have have to look like that 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 two year old I showed you. That was pretty extreme. Um, and again, you really have to pay attention to how you set your horse up to get them square to see how they stand. Like I've I've done exams myself where there were lameness exams or pre purchase exams, and the horse stand there. I'm like, oh, he's towed out. And then like two minutes later, I look at him like. Okay, now he's towed in. All right, we really have to focus and get this horse to stand straight because they'll trick you. Like I, I swear it happens to me all the time. So again, make them stand where they naturally want to stand too. Don't put them where you think they should be because that will kind of throw things off. And again, it's not like there's not horses out there that aren't confirmationally good, but usually if you look hard enough, you can find something. But that's okay because I mean, people aren't perfect. Horses aren't perfect. That's the way they go. And there's Horses that do perfectly well and compete at high levels that aren't necessarily perfect confirmation. It just happens. So and there's a lot of things that roll into that, you know, congenital problems, issues with birth, 
um, when they're younger, contracted tendons or flexural deformities, um, growing too fast. That, that horse I showed you with the toad out, when I went and saw that horse, it had a difficult time even getting up. It laid down most of the time because its growth plates were so angry and its legs were so upright from growing too much, it didn't want to stand. Um, and within a month or two of kind of just even changing the diet, simply just changing the diet, the horse was able to stand up and walk around and kind of trot and stuff. I mean, the lady was legitimately concerned we we're gonna have to put the horse down. She's like, this wants to lay down all the time. It's getting sores, I don't know what to do. So um, there's a lot of factors that play into it. Environment, genetics, husbandry, um, nutrition. Um, same thing in dogs and cats, especially like particularly big dogs, big breed dogs. They worry about they grow too fast and they get problems like Great Danes and things like that. Like they worry about them getting problems confirmationally and such because they grow too fast. So um, it's not quite the same as in us unless you're watching like the Westminster Dog Show. But um, definitely we pick on confirmation a lot more on a day to day basis with horses. You know, whether it's your trainer and you're looking at a horse, your farrier looking at the horse or the veterinarian look at the horse. You know, confirmation is always important and it ties into everything, how the horse moves. And, and then potentially soundness. And again, just because I have a confirmational problem doesn't mean they're gonna have a soundness issue. Um, so you can't say that, but it just sets you up and it makes you more conscientious of watching stuff too. So you guys got any other questions or comments? Uh, I gladly take comments or criticisms as long as they're not super mean, I'm very sensitive. Um, but that's kind of all I got. Hopefully the next talk will be a little bit more fun. We'll have a combination of x-rays and ultrasounds and MRIs. I have a lot of pictures of horses and their own x-rays or things like that. So you can really get an idea of how it looks next to each other on stuff like that. So hopefully that'll be a good one for you guys. A little bit more entertaining than just horses with the lines. You'll kind of see cooler stuff, so. But that's kind of all I got on my end, unless you guys got more questions. Uh, you just mentioned contracted tendons. What are yeah. those? So you have to remember, so there's tendons on the front and back of legs. The ones in the back are called flexors. The ones on the front are called extensor tendons, and they do just that. So you got to remember, a horse walks on one finger, right? So if you look at the palm of your hand, those are all flexors. All right, so that's why you can flex your hand. You can make a fist, all right? So you think about when a horse lifts its leg up, it flexes its leg. <clears throat> if they get contracture of the flexors of the back of the leg, they want to start to pull the legs upright. So those horses will, can potentially get upright in their pasterns um, and they can start to get over at the knee because the, the, what happens a lot of times is the bones and the tendons are not growing at the same rate and it starts to pull everything together. It literally is pulling too hard on those tendons. Um, the flip side of that is uh, where they get laxity and they're actually too loose. So everything sags a lot, kind of like a wet noodle. Um, and you kind of deal with those in different manners. Um, what you hope to do is when they're very young, I mean, like very young, you catch those things and there is, um, you know, you can put splints on them to help them. Um, there are some surgeries you can do when they get older. Um, even some medications that we give that kind of help slow processes down or speed other things up. So they kind of realign themselves because every, everything's about a balance. So you want a balance of things growing at the same rate. Um, so uh, that's kind of what the tendon contractures are. But when we talk about that, it's at the, typically it's at the back of the leg and that's what causes the problem. Um, and again, those are things that we watch. Now, like when a baby's first born, look, they look like a mess, like things just aren't trying to hold yet. But as they get older, especially people that do a lot of breeding stuff, they start to watch, you know, is the ankle sinking too much? So they look or front or hind ankles, are they sinking too much in their ankles? So maybe they're a little bit lax or, or boy, are they looking a little bit too upright? Do we need to try and deal with that? So those are things you pay attention for, which is another good point. Confirmation does not apply to old horses or mature horses. It goes even to the young horses. We watch that stuff. Now, again, you have to grade a little bit differently to some degree because they're growing. So a lot's going to happen. Um, but you still have to watch it. But that's a good question. I don't think that's specifically in the lameness thing. We talk more about bowed tendons and tendon injuries themselves. So that's not necessarily an injury per se, the contracture, but definitely something you have to be aware of. 
Anybody okay. else? Very quiet group. Or is it because Friday night you're like, I don't listen, I want to listen to someone talk about confirmation at eight o'clock. I don't blame you. <laughs> it's actually nice out today too, not snowing. So yeah. All right. If anyone doesn't have any questions, then we're good. Is that a, is that a hand up? No, that's a <laughs> Sure. I, thought, I, thought, I got excited. I thought you had a question. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, Madison has a hand up. I don't. You have a question. So when you a question for confirmation, because that's like the whole main thing of tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, when looking at confirmation, so the legs are the most important things to look at. Not necessarily. The whole horse has to be. Um, but I think the legs, you really are come some play more in a role of it, but everything, again, everything, you have to do a whole body look, you know, and this talked about more about structure, but even confirmation goes into muscle mass, you know, is muscle mass, even in their hind end and their front end. Um, but legs, because most of the horse is a leg are usually the confirmational things we tie into, but being uphill or downhill, being croup high being long backed versus short backed, um, definitely things you want to watch out for. And remember, again, as a horse is growing too, like their withers and their croup may be different heights than next thing you know, in a year, everything's different. Um, so the bulk of this is on legs, but legs is, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the most important part, but it is a lot to do with, with things because a lot of, if you look at the lameness side of things, um, a lot of those problems are leg related. You know, majority of a horse's problems when it comes to lameness are knee down and a high percentage of that are like ankle and foot down or ankle down, so into the foot, you know. Shoulder issues are not very common, contrary to what some people think. Um, true shoulder problems, so like arthritis of shoulders and stuff like that, those are less common and elbows. Horses can get sore and stuff in their shoulders and things like that, but a lot of times it's compensation from something someplace else. Um, you can get shoulder arthritis, you can get elbow arthritis, um, not as common. In the back end, stifles, definitely you can see arthritis and stifles. Hips can get arthritis in them, um, especially in older horses or ones that have had traumatic issues. Um, but like kind of tying, if you want to tie confirmation into lameness stuff, um, a lot of what we see has to deal with the lower limb, knee and hock down specifically. But good question. But I, everything's important. Like you don't want to, you know, buy a horse with perfect legs and its withers are six inches higher than its croup. Like that's gonna be. You better hold on tight. <laughs> Exaggerated example, but you get my point. Every everything ends up being important. And again, things tie into things. If they're very upright in their shoulder start looking at the rest of the leg. Are they camped under? What's their pasture angle like? And things like that. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'll stick on too if there's any extra questions, but I think, thank you. That was amazing. It was very thorough. And I think we got a lot of, learned a lot of new things. Was that, was that too much for you guys? Was that enough? Was that overbearing? Good. Cause if it is, like, cause if I need to change, and if you guys think of something, let us know one of the two of us, cause if I need to twerk how I, I present things or, or things like that, I want to make sure that you guys understand this. So if you're like, Hey, you know what? He's going a little bit more than I want to follow or less, or I wish you would do this a little bit differently, like let us know. I'm more than happy to try and tailor these talks around you guys. Cause if you guys aren't getting anything from it, I'm wasting my night and you're wasting your night. So I want you to be able to learn stuff from this. Um, so for sure, don't be afraid to voice opinions about something that you might want to see changed or, 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 or something that may help you guys understand. I want to do that. And if you do end up thinking of questions that pertain to this lecture afterwards, we can still talk about those in the next lecture or something like that too. Don't be like, oh, well, the confirmation lecture is over. I can't ask questions about that. Like that's, if you, we need to go back to stuff, we can't, so. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Alrighty guys. Well, thank you very much for spending your Friday evening with me. Yeah. I think I went a little bit long-winded, but I apologize for that. I tend to do that. 
Um, but thank you very much for uh, uh, doing the Zoom meeting. I've never done one like this, so this is different for me too. It took it took us like 20 minutes to get me set up. <laughs> so. yeah. Alrighty, guys. Well, have a good weekend. Uh, enjoy not having snow, and I'll see you in a couple weeks. All right, bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much.